Heavenly Father, thank you for what we've heard so, mar- so far. Thank you for filling our hearts and minds. Pray you'd give us ears to listen again. Help us to marvel at the great truths we're thinking about this morning. Help, help Paul bring them out from your words for us now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Uh, j- just, just to say that, that um, we've been down in Bath uh, for the last few years, in the ministry in Bath, in a place called Whitcomb Baptist Church, and then I retired about a year ago, and we got back to Birmingham. And I go off for a walk early in the morning. It's a park just across the road. And I was walking across. And early in the morning when I go, it's mainly dog walkers and, and um, joggers. And, and I got to know this guy a little bit, and he says hello from time to time. One morning, it was a beautiful morning in the spring, and uh, he got his dog, and, and he said to me in a lovely accent, he said, uh, it's nice to see you. He said, uh, looks as if it's going to be a Boston day. And in my heart, I thought, oh, it's good to be home. <laughs> this, is, this has got to be the language of heaven, hasn't it? <laughs> People say it's Welsh, but you do, you do know, don't you, that Shakespeare spoke in a Brummy accent. So, so if you ever study Shakespeare, it's not to be or not to be, it's to buy or not to buy. That is the question. But you, there is a wonderful feel, isn't there, about home? Home is the place that when you get there, they've got to let you in. It's, it's, you know, we all like, I travel a fair bit and I go here, there and everywhere. This week I've been in Nottingham and in Bristol and in Leicester and in three or four different places. And, and you know, I come back late at night and, and, and I just walk through the door and it's just great to be home. And that's our experience. Life is a journey. It's a pilgrimage. It's tough, but we're going to get home. And this is our true destiny. This is what Jesus has gone to prepare for us. Now, you think what's he doing in the last 2,000 years is preparing a home for you. Isn't that amazing? When, when, when they built the Taj Mahal, it was some guy building it because he'd lost his wife and he wanted, and, and, and he spent a few years, spent billions of pounds or millions of pounds getting this beautiful building, which of course is now decaying. You think what heaven is like. Jesus has had 2,000 years to get it ready. Isn't that exciting? We're going home. And so what is it going to be like? We've kind of concentrated a little bit on, 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 on Revelation. We'll go back to Revelation as well. But there are five things I want you to think about in this next session. And I hope we'll get through them all. If we don't, we're going to finish at 12 o'clock. We might go on a couple of minutes later if that's okay. And if you need to leave at 12, please feel free to do so. But we're going to be talking about it in this way. And first of all, heaven is bodily. By which we mean, in heaven, we will have a body. When people think about heaven, that's what they kind of think of, isn't it? You know, very, very sort of misty. And, you know, that, that picture, the big picture there, I mean, I've seen that in Christian bookshops. Heaven. You know, you go up a stairway and, and there's no St. Peter at the pearly gates, but it's kind of like that or, 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 or you know, on a cloud playing a harp. And, and, you know, and people say, well, if it's going to be like, I'm going to be bored out of my skull. Yeah, is it really going to be like that? All kind of airy. For... No, heaven will be bodily. Remember what we said earlier, what are we as human beings? We're a body and a soul. That's the way God made us. And neither of them are, are, are you can't dismiss either of them. It's not that, well, my body's important and, or my soul doesn't matter. You know, no, we are body and soul. And death is that horrible moment when the body and the soul separate. If you think of the first words of the Bible, on Genesis 2 rather, and the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground... And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. There are two things there. The the rabbis used to say that God took the dust and he kissed it into existence. It's a wonderful picture, isn't it? He breathes physically. There's physicality. There's the dust of the ground. And then there's the breath of life, our, our soul or our spirit. So we are dust. You know the story, don't you, about the, the little boy who heard about we're dust and his Sunday school teacher said, yeah, we come from the dust, we return to the dust. And he went home and he went under his bed and, and his bed was very dusty. He came downstairs covered with dust and his dad said, why are you so covered in dust? And he said, I've just been under the bed and there's somebody under there that are either coming or going. I don't quite know which. <laughs> you know, we are dust. That's what we are. But we're more than that. We're, we're special to God. God loves us. And so he's going to raise that dust from the earth. And Jesus is the model of our future resurrection bodies. Christ indeed has been raised from the dead. He is the first fruits 
of those who've fallen asleep. Let me just say about falling asleep. Remember we said earlier, at the intermediate state, where your loved ones are now, they're in a place where they're conscious. And people pick up, well, asleep, surely asleep means that you don't know. When the Bible talks about asleep, what it means is the body. The body sleeps. And, and what do you know about sleep? Sleep is wonderful, isn't it? It's refreshing, should be, it's great, but it's temporary. So the body rests, the body sleeps, and the body will be raised. The soul is conscious in the Lord's presence. Jesus is the first fruits. You know, if you go through a field, and should we say it's got tulips in the field, you're in, you're in Holland, and, 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 and it's early on in the spring, and, and there's just a little patch of the field, and the tulips have come up, and they're beautiful. What do you know? When you come back two weeks later, the whole field is going to be a cascade of beauty. Those first fruits are a symbol or a reminder or a guarantee of what the final harvest is going to be. So Jesus is the first fruit. So to understand what our resurrection bodies will be like, we need to think of Jesus. Paul puts it like this. He, Christ, will transform our lowly bodies so that they are like his glorious body. We will have a body which is like the body of Jesus. So what do we know about the body of Jesus when he rose from the dead? What we know, first of all, is it was a real body. He really rose physically. Remember in Luke chapter 24, you can read it when you get home, um, they come to see Jesus and they're not sure, is he a ghost? Is he a spirit? And they're not sure, they're terrified. Because they know he's dead, but they think, is this a ghost in front of us? So he says, look, touch me, listen to me. Give me something to eat. And he takes a piece of fish and he eats it. And, and, and if he was a ghost, a ghost can't, an angel can't eat fish. Um, but, but it's a physical body. It's real. It's in front of them. We will have a physical body. Remember what he said earlier? The new creation isn't just kind of airy-fairy in the sky. It's a new creation. It's this world. It's a physical world. It's beautiful. It's glorious. It's the curse gone. It's magnificent. And in a physical body, like the body of Jesus will be in this world. And it will be the same body. Body that raised from the, the tomb, body of Jesus, was the same body that had been crucified. How do we know that? Because he says, look at my hands and my feet, touch me. It really is me. The physical bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ is the non-negotiable foundation of the Christian faith. If Jesus didn't rise physically from the dead, then the whole faith collapses. It's not true. Okay, that's as simple as that. It wasn't a spiritual resurrection. You remember a few years ago, there was a, there was a bishop who said, oh, they, you don't need a physical resurrection, you know. Um, it, it, it was, that, that is a conjuring trick with bones. Do you remember that? You don't need a physical resurrection. All you need is a kind of a spiritual experience, you know. Like, like, like when, you know, when spring comes and you're walking down through the streets and you see the, the daffodils and you feel good inside and you say, all the little bar lambs on the hillside and you, you kind of think, oh, isn't life wonderful? And you're born again with a new... No, 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 it wasn't an experience. They saw him as the same Jesus risen from the dead. And our bodies will be these same bodies. We will be raised. Now, people kind of say, how on earth can that be? You know, should, I be should I be buried or should I be cremated? Because if I'm cremated, you know, what's going to happen to my body? Well, I ask you a question. Where is Paul's body now? Paul's body... Was, he died and it was, he was executed. He was probably put in a, in a common grave. 2,000 years, there's nothing left. Not like one of the mummies that you can dig up and find the bones. It's gone. Been eaten by worms. And so you say, well, how on earth is God going to raise that? Well, God knows. <laughs> now, we, what, what we know today, what I didn't know in the first century, is that we've all got DNA. We've all got a unique code. The body you sit in today is not the exact body that you had I think it's seven years. Over seven years, the body renews. All the cells renew. So it's the same you, but it's, it's changed. And it will be a, a bodily resurrection. We will be raised in a physical body, and it will be this body. And we'll recognize one another. Except that we'll be changed. There will be a moment. I will have hair. Can you imagine that? <laughs> I went, to, I went to, to, to put some petrol in the car this morning, and my wife said, I've forgotten my hairspray. Now, what do you do if you forget your hair? So I went and asked the guy there, have you got any hairspray? And he looked at me. <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, but, but there you go. We will have, it'll be renewed as we'll see in a moment. But it's a transformed body. That's what I'm saying. It'll be a completely changed body. All the things that cause us trouble now will be gone forever. What it'll be like, well, this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, the body that is sown perishable 
is raised imperishable. It's sown in dishonour, it's raised in glory, it's sown in weakness, it's raised in power, it's sown a natural body, it is raised as a spiritual body. So what does that mean? It's imperishable. The seeds of decay and death are in us from conception. The moment we're born and grow, we, 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 we're beginning to die, in a sense, aren't we? And we get older, and, and um, you know, I used to play a lot of football, and my left leg is a bit kind of achy in the morning, and you know what? This sounds pathetic. I find it really difficult to get down and cut my toe, cut my toenails on my on my left leg. Isn't that, isn't that pathetic? <laughs> well, if you're my age, you probably realise that that's the way it is. Our bodies get old, and but the resurrection body is incorruptible. It will never perish. It'll never feel the ravages of time. It'll be untouched by decay and disease and death. And you will have. I think this is wonderful. The wisdom of age and the strength of youth. Okay, wouldn't that be wonderful? The wisdom of age and the strength of you. Sometimes people say to me, oh, that's wise. I think, well, it's not wise. I've just been around a long time. You know, when you're around a long time, you kind of get to know things. But it'll be a glorious body. Our current bodies have sin and, right and righteousness. We all sin. Every one of us. I sin, you sin. We all sin. And, and, and we fail to come up to God's glory. But the new body will be marked out by glory, free from every taint of sin and evil forever. It's not just that we won't sin. It's not just that we won't want to sin. We won't want to want to sin. Sin is gone forever. And it will be a powerful body. Human frailty and limitations, we all feel them. We are earthen vessels. The equivalent of an earthen vessel today is a plastic bag. Now, what do you do with a plastic? Well, you probably keep your plastic bags because you, know, you don't want to buy another one, but, but they're just disposable. And our bodies are disposable. Decay and frustration are gone forever. A new stamina, a new speed, a new durability, new unimaginable capacities. You know, we've got a long time to learn new things. So, so if you don't play a musical instrument, music's pretty important in heaven, so maybe you'll learn to play an instrument. You know, it, it won't just be a harp. It could well be a you know, a trumpet or a, who knows? If you enjoy certain things, you you know, I can remember when I, when I did sixth form and, and A-levels, and I love history, I love history. And I remember my history teacher saying, now, for, for X number of hours a week, five, six, seven hours a week, you're gonna be studying history. And I thought, isn't that wonderful? I can, I can study history as much as I want. I'm very sad, aren't I? But you know, I love it and you learn new things. So don't think of heaven as kind of boring. No, in a new resurrection body, we will explore this glorious creation. New imagined capacities, and it will be spiritual. It doesn't mean that it'll be non-physical. It means that it'll be animated by the Holy Spirit. No struggles with temptation, no failure, no grappling with doubts and fears, no wrestling with pain and death. Those things are gone forever. Johnny Erickson, you all know, Johnny Erickson, or read books by Johnny Erickson, you know I'm talking about. Johnny had this terrible accident. She was uh, quadriplegic. She can't move her arms or her feet. Johnny writes like this. I can hardly believe it. I, with shriveled, bent fingers, atrophied muscles, gnarled knees, and no feeling from the shoulders down, will one day have a new body, light, bright, and clothed in righteousness, powerful and dazzling. Can you imagine the hope that gives someone whose spinal cord injures like me. Or someone who has cerebral palsy, or brain injury, or who has multiple sclerosis. Imagine the hope this gives someone who is a manic depressive. No other religion, no other philosophy promises new bodies, hearts and minds. Only in the gospel of Christ do hurting people find such an incredible hope. And it's all about the resurrection. You know the story, don't you, about, about it's an apocryphal story, but Joseph of Arimathea comes home on, 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 um, on, on Good Friday evening, and uh, his wife says, uh, I, I hear all sorts of stories. What's been happening in Jerusalem? Well, Jesus has been crucified, and he's died, and, 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 and they put his body in our new tomb. And his wife said, in our new tomb? That was going to be our tomb. We were going to be buried there. We prepared that. That was going to be for us. And he says, don't, don't worry, don't worry, dear. He's only borrowing it for the weekend. 
The resurrection is certain and it is glorious because the resurrection of Jesus is certain and glorious. It will be a bodily existence. Number two, it will be a social existence. In other words, we won't be on our own. Heaven is not solitary communion between the soul and Christ. It's not me and Jesus and nobody else. It is me and Jesus, but it's intensely personal. It's also not private. If you, if you don't like church and you don't like people, well, you better get used to them soon because you're going to spend a lot of time with a lot of people forever and ever and ever, okay? And that's what it'll be like. Here's, here's Revelation 7. After this I looked and there before me was a great multitude no one could count. That's a picture of heaven. So many you can't even begin to count them. From every nation, tribe, people and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb and they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. White robes are a symbol of victory and purity. Palm branches are what you do when you celebrate. He sees a number and he can't count them. There are too many of them. Revelation 19, they come to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Um, who, who likes um, um, receptions after a wedding? Who likes going to a reception after a wedding? Yeah, I hate it. I absolutely, because you're hanging around forever. You know, if people invite me to come and conduct their wedding, I say, one condition, you don't invite me to the reception. My wife gets so mad. <laughs> you know, she, it's, have you seen where they're going? You know, but, but this is a wedding reception we will all enjoy. Okay? This will be wonderful. The church is the bride for which Christ died. He's preparing an eternal home for her. Heaven is a banquet and a feast. Will we eat in heaven? Well, I don't want to be dogmatic, but, but do you enjoy eating? You'll be in a body. You know, you'll have, you'll have the most delicious food, I would imagine, and never put on a pound. Can you imagine that? That's, that, I don't know. <laughs> All divisions and disunity are ended. You know, one of the tragedies now is that Christians fall out in heaven, there's great unity. A couple of questions. Will we know each other in heaven? Will we know each other in heaven? Well, in Luke, Jesus' disciples recognized him in the upper room. You know, once, once they saw it, they thought he was a ghost because they couldn't believe it. Once they saw him, they knew it was him. And of course, we'll know one another in heaven. In 1 Thessalonians 4, that great passage where he says, you know, the dead in Christ rise and we will be forever with the Lord forever. He's, he's comforting people who've lost loved ones. There's no comfort if you think, and the dead will rise, but you'll never know them. <laughs> of course, you'll know them. Here is 1 Thessalonians 2. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and our joy. Paul says, when I get to heaven and I see you, oh, it's going to be so wonderful. I, you know, I, I preached the gospel, you believed, you were saved, and I'm going to rejoice. I went back to my first church in Chippenham, and, and, and I was talking to this guy, and he was a Christian. When I was there, he wasn't a Christian. And he said to me, you know, the very last evening you, you were at that church, we did communion. And, and I've been listening to your preaching year after year, after year, after year. <laughs> and that night, I came to Christ. And when they came round with the bread and wine, for the very first time I took it. Because now I've become a Christian. Thank you for preaching. I said, why didn't you tell me? I would have loved to have known, but it doesn't matter really. Because there'll be others that you've witnessed to, you've prayed for. And, you, you, you know, you, there's a prayer list and there's a name on the list and you think, well, I don't know what, who that is, but I'm going to pray for them. And you've prayed for them, you get to heaven and they'll walk up to you and say, thank you for praying for me. Of course we'll know one another in heaven. Anybody know who that is? He's Scottish. Samuel Rutherford, okay? He was the pastor of Anworth by the Solway, which is just over the border from Carlisle. And he wrote, uh, he wrote about heaven and there's a hymn that comes from it called The Sands of Time Are Sinking. I think it's a wonderful hymn. I love that hymn. In the original, it's got about 36 verses. We sing about four or five. The, the one that I love most of all is The Bride Eyes, Not Her Garment, But Her Dear Bridegroom's Face. I will not think of glory, but on my King of Grace. Not on the crown he giveth, but in his pierced hand. The Lamb is all the glory in Emmanuel's land. It's a wonderful hymn, and, and, and you know, it's good to meditate on that and think about that. But one of the verses that isn't contained in our hymn books, or we don't have hymn books, do we? But one of the verses that we don't use is this one. Fair Anworth by the Solway, to me thou still art dear, that's my Scottish accent, in from the verge of heaven I drop for thee a tear. Oh, if one soul from Anworth meet me at God's right hand, my heaven will be two heavens in Emmanuel's land. 
If there's one person who's been saved through my ministry, oh, it'll be fantastic. So keep witnessing and keep praying. Keep evangelizing. Think of the most joyful moments you had in fellowship. And there's a vast number of people in heaven. There'll be loved ones there. There'll be friends there. There'll be new friends. I mean, we mentioned Habakkuk. We'll get to know. I mean, you've got a long, 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 long time, and there's a number you can't count, so constantly developing new, deeper, wonderful relationships. That's my grandson. He's called Abraham. Some of you know about him. He's a beautiful little boy. He's now about six. And uh, he was born with the most severe, severe disability. He's blind. He has none of the higher faculties. In fact, he doesn't have the abilities of a newborn baby. His, his mum and dad are there in Barry. Dad's very Welsh, and so he's a little Welsh boy. And, and we love him to bits. In fact, we're going over to see them later this next week. And he's, but he can do nothing. He's a complete, completely dependent. And you know, people say, well, it would have been good if they'd known in the, in the womb and, 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 and you know, ended his life in the womb. How dare they say that? This is a very, very, very loved and precious little boy. My wife, my, myself, my, everybody in the family, he's, he's special. One day, when we get to heaven, I'm convinced a startlingly beautiful young man will walk up to us and he'll say, hello, granddad, hello, grandma. And we'll know it's him because he'll speak in a Welsh accent. <laughs> That's the hope, isn't it? The hope of glory. How many of you have lost loved ones? Husbands, wives, children, parents. They're in the Lord, you'll see them again. Will there be marriage in heaven? That's a question we often ask. We are heirs together. So when we're married, remember, you know, there's no more intimate relationship than that. We're kind of we're bound together. But in heaven, there is no marriage. The bond ceases. The resurrection people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Marriage points forward to something greater than itself. You know, the most significant relationship on earth is, is, of course, our relationship with the Lord, his husband and wife. But that's an image of something greater. Marriage on earth is a foretaste of the marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven. Christ is joined with his bride forever. So will we know one another? Yes. Will we be married? No. I think we'll probably have a special place in our lives for, for those that we've walked through life with. And will there be gender in heaven? In other words, will we be male and female in heaven? That's an interesting one. Think about it for a moment. Even the angels appear as, as, you, as male, but that, that's not the important thing. Jesus was still a man. He wasn't some sort of nebulous half man and half woman. He was a man. So I think, and again, don't quote me on this, I think when we get to heaven and land, your body will be men and will be women. Our body is fundamental to what we are, isn't it? That's what we are. That's why it's important. And in heaven, gender, or in earth, gender is important. And we will have a gendered existence. I know that that's kind of slightly countercultural, but... You know, men are men and women are women. And when the Bible speaks about gender, it says there are two genders. And I don't want to be offensive this morning, but, but you know, that seems to be what the Bible teaches. Okay, number three, it will be a place of rest. Oh. Isn't that good? Jesus gives his people rest now. Ecclesiastes, frustration is our common lot. It's not easy living in this world, is it? Life is up and down. Life is difficult, you know, we get frustrated and we go after things and they don't amount to much and so on. It's remorseless and exacerbating and wearisome. Jesus promised to give us rest now. Can I say again, if you're not a Christian, you know, if you're saying, well, life is so hard and so Christ gives his people rest. Great hope of the gospel is rest. Uh, look at these words. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. You know, after a busy day, a long day, isn't it great to go to bed at night? Hello? Do you, do you stay up in Worcester? Is that what you do? No, no. You know, you're exhausted. You've worked hard. You go to bed. You put your head on the pillow. You fall asleep. It's rest. And heaven is rest. Do you remember Pilgrim's Progress? You read Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan? That's a wonderful picture. In the old days, I say the old days, um, <laughs> what's the old days? In, in 100 years ago, everybody had the Bible and Pilgrim's Progress. People don't read Pilgrim's Progress as much as they do, should do, but they really ought to, because it's a wonderful picture of the Christian life. And it's a battle, one thing after another. And heaven is a place of rest. 
Weary pilgrims come home. They are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them in their presence. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. Think of someone on a pilgrim. You're going through the desert and you're hungry and you're thirsty. But that's finished now. The sun will not beat down on them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The word wipe away, that, the Greek word literally means take away every semblance of a tear. So some translators put it, it's almost as if he removes the tear ducts. Not all tears are bad, some tears are tears of joy. But in heaven there's no weeping or mourning or grieving or sadness. We have rest from all the sorrows of this world. They are gone forever. Here's, here's how it's reinforced in chapter 21. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. If you've lived for long in this world, you know that this world is not easy, is it? It's painful. The only condition for suffering, the only condition for suffering is to live long enough. If you live long enough, you will suffer. And there's a kind of a triumphalistic gospel that people say, well, Christians shouldn't suffer. If only you had more faith. If only this, if God, no, no, we know that. We know that physically we suffer. We know that, 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 that we get emotional pain. We lose people we love. We have people that we love to bits and they, they've not accepted the Lord. And they turn their back on God and it just breaks our hearts. You know, I, I, I remember talking once to, to, to a, at a conference about, about children and, 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 you know, our children not being saved. And a lady came to me afterwards and she said to me, um, you know, my son has just, just told me nothing to do with the Christian faith. He wants to reject it completely and he's, he's really rejecting me as well. She said, can I ask you a question? Am I still allowed to love him? And I said, well, if you love it, it's painful. Do you remember when Prince Philip died and the Queen said... Pain is what you pay, or suffering is what you pay, if you love people. You, know, you can get rid of love and stop loving people, and you, you won't have any pain. But if you love people, you will experience pain. It's like that tearing apart of those two trees. And we think, well, I, I don't know how to. And sometimes in this life, pain is so intense that we think it'll never go away. And some people carry scars throughout all that life. Yeah, you know, people say, oh, no, stop Stop being like that, you know, stop lamenting. I've written a book called Learning to Lament, by the way. Stop lamenting. And, 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 and it struck me that people say, oh, no, you should be more positive here as a Christian. When you go to a funeral, is it right to weep? Of course it is. Because we're not in heaven yet. Do you remember what we did? We're in the middle of the book. There are lots of tears there all the way through. And the sort of ready, you know, just name it and claim it, and, you know, blab it and grab it. Prosperity gospel is rubbish only rubbish it's not only true it is incredibly incredibly dangerous because we think well i'm not much of a christian because I, I suffer it's in heaven that he takes all the tears away it's in heaven that he removes those things looking at life now looking at the world now it's like looking at this beautiful picture through a pane of glass that's broken and you can see it's beautiful and you can see that god has given us lots of good things to enjoy but but they're kind of marred because the, 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 the pane of glass is broken in heaven, the pain of glass is gone. There's no more curse, no more pain. All that mars God's creation is banished forever. No more pain or disease or sickness. The mourner is comforted. And it's not simply a return to Eden, because in this new creation, there's no way out. Salvation is both restorative, repairing the damage that's been done by sin, and progressive, moving the work of creation onto its completion. When God made the world, and he, he said to Adam, they care for the world for me, they had a job to do. And so Eden was to grow and grow and grow. And there's a sense in which we continue to serve God and reign with him forever and ever. We'll be delivered from warfare. You know, why is it so tough being a Christian? Because we've got an enemy. The devil hates us. The devil will do everything in his power to destroy us. We're not battling against flesh and blood. We're battling against spiritual forces of evil. So Paul, Peter says, be alert and sober. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking for someone to devour. Have we ever, have anybody ever been to Dudley Zoo or Dudley Zoo? Anybody in there? I, I remember going as a kid, and there are lions there at, the, at the, in one of the. And the lions are just they're just bone idle lions. They're tip, <laughs> typical black country lions. You know, we're not going to do anything much. You know, because people come and feed us in the wild. Lions are prowling about because their their dinner's not going to be served at twelve o'clock. They've got to go and find their dinner. And that's what he said. The devil is looking for you. 
And if you think it's easy to be a Christian, no, it's not. Somewhere in Gloucester, well, I'll give it away now. Where do you think that is? And you kind of say, well, that's Helmand province. It's actually somewhere in Gloucester. Because what they've done is to prepare troops when they were going out to Helmand province, they, they kind of dubbed up this place that looked like Helmand province. And so if you go around the corner, there are all the, all the houses and, and the people there. And it looks as if you've landed in, in, in the Middle East. But of course, it's only to prepare them. So there are bullets, but they're dud bullets. Nobody gets hurt. And there are bombs, but they're just a noise. Nobody gets hurt. And so you can go there and, and you, you look as if you're in a battle, but you're not really. You're not really in a battle at all. You know, it's, it's, it's just pretend. And we think the Christian life is just pretend. No, it's a battle. The devil hates this church. The devil hates you. The devil hates the leaders of this church. The devil hates your marriage. The devil hates your kids. And you've got to fight a battle. And the moment you opt out of the battle, then, then you're in trouble. In heaven, the battle is over. What happens to the devil? The one who deceives them is thrown into the lake of fire. He is crushed, never to rise again, never to disease, never to tempt. It's not just the devil, is it? We have sin in our own hearts. When I, when I um, was in, in my first church, there was a guy called Dave. Dave was, was converted out of the most amazing circumstances. He was a real rough-and-tumble guy. Um, um, <laughs> to put it colourfully, every third or fourth word was an expletive. You know, he, just, he, just, he, just, he worked in a factory. He was a, he was a tough guy. And I remember him coming to me one day and said, I want to become a Christian. I said, that's wonderful, Dave. He said, but before I become a Christian, I need to stop swearing, don't I? I said, what do you mean? He said, I need to just clear up my life. And I said, no, if you try and clear up your life, you'll never do it. Come to Jesus as you, were, as you are. He'll clear up your mouth. And that's what happened. He came to Christ and, and God changed him. It's wonderful. You know, we don't need to clear our lives. We come to Jesus as we are and he'll clear up our lives. We have to repent. We have to leave sin behind, but we have to come as we are and he'll accept us. It's like when, you know, because people come and help my wife with, with the, the housework some days, you know, the ladies are coming in the afternoon, on Wednesday afternoon, my wife will say, they come in the afternoon, go around the house and tidy it up and clean it before they arrive. <laughs> well, I don't want the ladies to come in and find it's untidy and, and dirty. Well, that's what they're coming for. You know, we think we've got to clean our lives before Christ will accept us. No, no, he, we come as we are. He cleans us up. By his blood, he cleanses us. Six months after his baptism, Dave came to me and he said, Pastor, I'm not a Christian. I said, what do you mean? He said, it's like this. He said, I, I, I can't be a Christian, can I? Because I, I, there's this thing inside me. I really, really, really love Jesus. I love him so much. I want to serve him. I want to follow him. The most important thing in my life is Jesus. But I keep letting him down. I keep on sitting. And there's something that keeps pulling me away like a magnet. I, I hate it, he said. I want to follow you. I can't be a Christian, can I? And I said, Dave... Welcome to the club. Because that's what it is. We struggle against sin. We long to be pure. In heaven, in heaven, absolute perfection. No flesh to crucify, no pain to, uh, no pain to face, no malice to, to fear. No possibility of a future fall. Not only we will not sin, we'll be free from sin, we'll be free from the desire of sin. You remember the old things that you weigh things in the... People use that these days? You know, you're, you're weighing your... You're making a cake, and you know you've got you've got um, um, butter, yeah, and and flour, and um, eggs, <laughs> sardines. Well, yeah, whatever. And you put you put your ingredients on one side, and you put your weights on the other. And you got the one side, and into the one side you put all the pain of this world, all the sorrow, all the sickness, all the heartbreak, all the things that get you down, and bang, down goes that side. And then you get to heaven, and Jesus wipes, or oh, God wipes away all tears from your eyes, and you have a new resurrection body, and you've got all these wonderful people to be with forever and ever and ever. And you know what happens? Just a moment in heaven, bang! Down goes the other side. Our light and momentary suffering is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory. Now you say to me, it ain't light and suffering. And, and, and it isn't. Where Paul writes that, he's talked about his own suffering and it's heavy and it's difficult. But it's comparing it with heaven. No one's going to get to heaven and say, well, uh, you know, it was a, that was a mistake being a Christian, was it? We'll rejoice. Suffering's gone forever. Number four, activity. 
activity. Heaven is a busy place. It's not the rest of immobility like a glorified rest time. You know, when you go and visit people in a rest time, my wife always says to me, make sure, make sure you don't wear a pullover or a jumper. Because these places, they're deadly, aren't they? They're so hot. And everybody's fast asleep. And occasionally they wake up and, and they, 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 who are you? And then they start talking about the bunions. And then they go back to sleep again. And we think of heaven like that. A rest is just, it's just you know, oh, it's going to be wonderful. I'm just going to sit back and sleep for, for, you know, forever. No, 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 no. It's an active place. It's a busy place. They are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night. They're devoted to service and joyful worship. When the Bible talks about works, it talks about two things. Worship is two things. It's the worship is of our lips. Worship is the total response of all that I am to all that God has revealed to me of himself. Worship is this kind of praise from our lips. So Peter says, uh, you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful life. There's a lot of worship in heaven. There's a lot of singing in heaven. You know, when do we sing? Maybe, maybe in the shower or, or when we're watching a football match. If it's the Albion, there's songs of deep lamentation. But you know, you're, you're singing because you just... We sing when we're happy. And we will sing God's praises and we will adore him forever and ever. Here's a, his great verses in Psalm 66. Shout, for joy, shout to, uh, for joy to God all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. I love these verses because it's three points and they all begin with an S. <laughs> shout and sing and say, oh, how great thou art. How awesome thou art. I mean, that word awesome is a much misused word, don't you think? You know, we had an awesome holiday. No, you didn't. You know, I, I had an awesome, this is the word, we had, we had an awesome pizza. Have you ever had an awesome pizza? No. I mean, what is it? It's basically cardboard with cheese on top. I mean, how can it be awesome? But God is awesome. And to declare his praises and to worship him forever and ever and ever. And that's what heaven is like. Constant worship of God. Here's John Piper. Mission is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is is mission exists because worship doesn't the goal of mission is the gladness of the peoples in the greatness of the lord why do we want people to be saved because we want them to praise god and adore him and worship him forever and that's what heaven will be like years ago edrin and i were at a convention three thousand people it's the last night and and we've just had the benediction and and suddenly out of this huge crowd somebody begins to sing there is a redeemer Jesus, God's own son. And before they got to the second line, 3,000 voices, a cappella without musical instruments, join in. When I stand in glory, I will see his face. And there I'll praise my king forever in that holy place. And you know one of those moments when you get a, a tingle down your spine, you think, wow. And heaven will be like that. Worshipping God forever and ever and ever. And Revelation has got more songs in it than, than almost anywhere else, probably than the book of Psalms. Uh, you know, here's something you can do when you get home. You know, if you want a bit of homework, look at the songs. There are five songs in chapters four and five. There's one in chapter seven. There's one in chapter 11. There's one in chapter 15. Songs. But worship is not just getting together on a Sunday and singing God's praises. In Romans, Paul says, he urges us, after you, uh, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing God. This is your true and proper worship. So worship is both those things. There's a narrow form of worship, which is praising God. There's worship of my life, so that you know, when, I, when I go and do something, I'm worshipping God. When, I, when I'm working on the car, I'm worshipping God. When, I, when I'm witnessing, I'm worshipping God. When I, whatever we're doing is for the glory of God. And if it's the glory of God, Paul defines it as worship. Whatever you do, whatever you do. In Genesis, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, birds of the sky and over every living thing. That was the original mission given to Adam and Eve, to go and explore the world, to go and enjoy the world. You know, God isn't mean. He wants you holy, he wants you happy. They're the same thing. In the end, holiness leads to happiness. And he wants us to enjoy the creation. He wants us to enjoy mountains and hills and, and, and so on. He wants us to enjoy relationships. And the original mission to Adam and Eve is go, go, and, go, and, go and do that thing in this world. And that is repeated for us. 
Here's a, here's a quotation. Paradise is no more no mere seminary where Adam and Eve while away the hours in theological discussion. They don't sit there all the day talking about God and talking about religion and talking about theology. I mean, that sounds brilliant, doesn't it? <laughs> to spend the whole day reading a book. Can you imagine anything better? I had to wait for six months for my books to arrive. We had to convert the garage. When the, when the garage was converted, we got all the books in place, and I went and I sat there and I thought, oh, heaven. You know, I... You know, I, 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 I was more excited than when I saw my grandchildren. But, but you know, no, not really. You know, isn't that, what's the most beautiful smell in the world? My wife says it's the breath of a newborn baby. I say it's the smell of a new book. You know, to, to experience, to explore, to find. And that's good, but it's not just that. I'm sure they did that. And they did it with relish than any of my students. But Eden offered a scope for art and science and technology as well as theology. The same will doubtless be true in the world to come. It's not just that we'll sit and worship God and do nothing else. We'll explore the world. We'll build because we're physical beings. It's a new creation. It's this world. It's much more. It's not just sitting on a cloud playing a harp. No cessation of activities. We're not static. We'll be grow developing new skills. We talked about this, didn't we? Musical, artistic, technological, intellectual abilities. We'll discover secrets and the beauties of the creation. We will boldly go where no man has ever been before. <laughs> Some of you recognize that, don't you? And the Bible talks about rewards as well. We get rewards. Now, salvation is the free gift of God. There are no degrees of salvation. There's not first and second class Christians in heaven. The dying thief got the lot. You know, he didn't have time to do more than just to cry out for mercy. He cried out for mercy and he got the whole of creation. He got the whole promise of paradise. And yet the Bible does teach about rewards. You think of the Beatitudes. Blessed are those, and this is what they'll receive. Blessed are those, this is what they'll receive. It says in 1 Corinthians 13, build with the right materials. Because on the day of judgment, some of you have been building with the wrong materials and it'll be gone. And some of you are building with gold and silver. And Paul says at the end of his life, at the very last book, letter that he writes to Timothy. I fought the good night, I, I finished the race, I've kept the faith, now is in store for me a crown which the righteous judge will give me. So none of us are going to be upset in heaven, none of us are going to be disappointed. There's no envy or jealousy or covetous. We're not going to look at some people's rewards and say, you know, I deserve more than what I've got, because we'll be, we'll be perfect. But it does seem to be that, 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 that there will be rewards. And you ask me, what, what does that mean? And my response is, buy my book in 12 months and I'll tell you. <laughs> that was, sorry, I shouldn't have said that, should I? That was naughty, bad. The central attraction of that is not the rewards. It's not freedom from pain and sickness. It's, those are great. Everything we've talked about so far, fellowship with loved ones, that's great. That's not, no, all those things are wonderful, but they're not the central attraction of heaven. The central attraction of heaven, the big thing about heaven, is that we'll be with the Lord. And I think we must never lose sight of that. Remember when the people of Israel sinned at Mount Sinai? And God had said, I'm going to go with you and I'm going to take you into the land. I'll give you a land flowing with milk and honey. And when they sin, God says to them, now, I'm still going to give you the land and it's going to be wonderful, it's going to be magnificent and, and I'll give you victory of your enemies, all of those things. It'll be more than you can imagine. But I won't go with you. You remember what the people do? They grieve and they mourn and they say, the land is no good without you, Lord. We want you. That's what we're longing for, to see Jesus. And that's what heaven is, ultimately. It's the ultimate satisfaction of knowing Christ. We were created to know God. If you're not a Christian this morning, forgive me for saying it, you're a bit like a beached whale. Okay? Forgive me, it's not a very nice picture, is it? Does anybody know that, 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 that film? What's it called? The whale and the snail and the whale? To kids, think, have you seen that? I've seen it about 10,000 times because my grandkids love it. It's about a, li about a little snail that goes on a journey in a whale. And it's a wonderful, pic a wonderful picture of this whale in the deep and he's enjoying this wonderful ocean and that's his element. And then he gets stranded, he gets beached. And he's still this magnificent creature, but he's on the beach. He's not in his element. And if we're without Christ, if we don't know God, we're out of our element. We were made for God. There's something inside us that cries out for God. And what we try and do is fill it with other things, idols and, and money and pleasure and all those things and sex and drugs and rock and roll. And none of them will satisfy because we're made for God. Here's, here's, the, here's the psalmist. You God, are, you, uh, you, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there's no water. The people in Exodus say, Lord, we don't want to go into the promised land. We don't want other blessings without you, Lord. 
John, in, in John 17, Jesus prays, Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Blaise Pascal said this, The infinite abyss of the human soul can fill, be filled only with an infinite object. In other words, with God himself. Richard Dawkins, who's a great enemy of the Christian faith, says, I, I wouldn't want to go to heaven, it would be so boring. And the answer to that is, well, you know, that's because you don't know God. If we have an infinite soul, and God is an infinite being, and we're going to be in heaven for infinity, what is it going to be like? It's going to be one glorious experience of God after another. Amazing. Um, I, I, I call this next bit the riddle of the sands. In Jeremiah, God says to his people, my people have committed two sins. They've forsaken me, the spring of living water, and they've dug out for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. In other words, they've rejected God and they've gone other other sources of water. Imagine you're in a desert and it's dry and your lips are parched and your tongue is swollen and, it, and you'd give anything for a glass of water, just cold water. And you come to the end of the desert and you see two things. On the one hand, you see this scummy, scummy mud. And there's kind of bits of water in there and it's filthy and it's dirty. And if you throw yourself face down and suck through your teeth, you get some moisture. And on the other side is a glorious spring of water. Just magnificent. It's beautiful. You know, wh when it comes down, you can feel the spray on your face. Here's my question. Whoops, wrong way. Here's my question. Are you going to go for the scummy mud with a bit of filthy, dirty, green algae water? Or are you going to go for that? Which one are you going to go for? It's not a trick question. You're going to go for that, aren't you? If you're not, then there's something wrong with you. <laughs> And, and, and God says to his people, that's, 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 the, that's the tragedy of my people. I bless my people. I've given myself to my people. And they've settled for secondary things. And as Christians, we do that as well. You know, we love things more than God. We love possessions. We love fame. We love all sorts of things. You can even love serving the Lord more than the Lord. So, so what do we need? We need God. And what is the central attraction of heaven? It is the vision of God. That's the consummation of heaven's delight. God is not only the cause of our hope, he is the center and heartbeat of our hope. I will be their God, they will be my people. So the rivers of life flow from the throne of God to, rest, uh, to, 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 to help us. He who sits on the throne will shelter them in his presence. The word, the word shelter literally means he will put the corner of his tent around them. Do you remember the story of Ruth in the Old Testament? When, the, when, when Ruth goes to Boaz... She says to Boaz, please accept me. Put the corner of your garment over me. It's a wonderful picture. I want you to be my husband. And you know, how do you propose to so how do you How do you accept that? Well, you take your garment, you put it over the person. It's an intimate picture. When I was courting my wife, I had a duffel coat like that. Do you remember those back in the 1960s and 70s? And we'd go for a walk and it'd be cold. Actually, sometimes it was quite warm. And my wife would say, I'm a bit cold. Can I come under your duffel coat? And I'd lift up my arm and she'd come under the duffel cart and I'd put it. was amazing to me, she, she wanted to come under, even when she was warm. You know, I, who knows? But it's a wonderful picture, isn't it, of, of love and intimacy. And God says, I'll shelter you. I'll do it. And we will see his face. Here's Psalm 17. As for me, I shall be vindicated and see your face when I awake I shall be satisfied with seeing your likeness. I will see. It's interesting, even in the Old Testament, people knew they would see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, says Jesus, for they shall see God. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Moses couldn't look at the Lord. You think of the great man Moses was. He saw something of the glory of God and his face shone. But to see God, God had to hide him in, 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 in his hand and hide him in a rock. And he saw the back end of God. We will see God. In our resurrection bodies, that's possible. Now, if God was to come here, we, we, we'd die. This vision isn't static. There's an infinite progress in our delight in God. The soul is like a vessel filled with endless supply of his presence. We discover more and more of his loveliness as eternally he communicates more of himself. Think about that. It's never going to be boring. Here, here's a quotation. How big is your hope? Is it the wingspan of your hope as big enough to get, uh, get you soaring? 
Is your hope big enough, imaginative enough, with wolves and lambs and lions thrown in for good measure? Hope on this grand scale, grand scale, this is the hope. It is big. It offers both the prospect of personal intimacy with God forever and a renewed world of peace and righteousness. It, just, it isn't just one thing or the other. God has a plan for you and for this whole world. The Lord Jesus Christ died for you and he will not be denied. Now, all the good things, it's all. It's, it's, it's a physical body in this world with rest and no pain and no suffering and the enjoyment of all the things that a good God gives us. You know, when God made the world, it was good, it was good, it was good, it was very good. It will be even better. But it's also the intimate relationship with God. The Pilgrim Fathers, <coughs> when they landed at Plymouth Rock, what did they know of the American continent? All that they knew was a narrow strip of land. And they went a bit in, inshore, but that was it. And they set up their base. I don't know how many miles they went inshore, how much they explored, but that's all they knew. They did not know what was beyond. They didn't know that in the north was Niagara Falls. They didn't know that in the far west was the Grand Canyon or, 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 or those great spouting mountains. They didn't know about all the trees in, 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 on, the, on the east coast or the mountains. They didn't know about the mighty Mississippi. They didn't know about the cornfields. They didn't know about the coast on the west where California is today. They didn't know in the north were those things. They knew none of those things. All they knew was that little narrow strip of land. And, 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 and they saw all sorts of things, I'm sure, but all sorts of different animals. And, and in the south, there's an, a whole new continent, South America, with the Amazon and wherever that is and strange creatures. <laughs> See what I'm saying? They knew this little bit. What they didn't know was this, this huge 3,000 miles across and then down into the south, thousands of miles. And, and the American people have explored all that area. When we get to heaven, we'll just be at the beginning in the character of God, knowing a bit about God. And for eternity, we'll explore more and more. The American continent's big, but it's not infinite, but God is infinite. And forever and ever and ever and ever and ever we will know more and more and more about God. Isn't that wonderful? We will be totally, utterly, completely satisfied. That's the Christian hope. So, a few minutes. If you have to go, then, then, then you can. Of course you can. A few minutes talking about those questions. We'll get some feedback, and then we'll finish. Okay? What are the practical implications of the doctrine? What other questions might you have? So a couple of minutes talking about it, then a bit of feedback, and then dinner time.
Okay, okay. Now, now let me just, just, in, just um, say again, if you need to go, please feel free to do so. I know some of you got busy things with family and so on, but what are the practical implications? Let's see if we can think of at least five. So who's going to start us off? Sorry? If we think about it, we will purify ourselves as he is pure. We're going to a place that is absolutely holy and absolutely perfect. And so I want to be as perfect and holy as I can. And I'm never going to reach it entirely in this world. We'll always have to battle with sin until the very end. But I just want to strive after it. If Jesus is coming back and he finds me kind of sinning, that, that's going to be disappointing. I won't lose my salvation, but I just want to keep going. I want to keep loving the Lord. So purify. Okay, brilliant. Number two? Concern for those who are not Christians. I mean, we haven't talked about hell today, but, but you know, everything I've said about heaven, just put the negative and the opposite about hell. I don't want to go into that, but it is reality. You know, and there are people who deny it these days and do everything they can to deny it. So we should be concerned for, for unbelievers to share the gospel. We want them to share this hope. Okay, number three. Yeah? The assurance, the comfort it brings. Whatever I go through in this world... Heaven will make up for it a million times over. No one gets to heaven and, and is full of regret. No one gets to heaven and thinks, well, that wasn't worth it, was it? This is the most glorious thing you can imagine. Remember the scales, all the pain, bang, down the other side. Good, one more. Sorry? We should rejoice and worship more. We should think about heaven in our worship. I did a survey of the Praise Hymn Book, and there are a few hymns about heaven there, but not many. There are some great old hymns, like the Sands of Time are Sinking. There are some wonderful new hymns as well, but we need to think more about heaven. You remember right at the beginning, Richard Baxter, half an hour a day. Well, if we don't do half an hour a day, at least we should be, you know... A bit. And, and, you know, singing songs, I, I'm not a great singer, but can I leave you a secret? I discovered this. When I was here as pastor, I never had a phone. When I went to, to Bath, one of the conditions of becoming a pastor is that I had one of these things. And you probably don't know this, but you can, you can get hymns on here. And when you're walking, you can listen to them and join in. Did you know that? Yeah. Never, never heard of that before. Well, I, you know, I suddenly discovered all sorts of things, you know, football results as well, but... <laughs> I keep them at a distance, yeah. But you, you see, you see to, to praise God, to rejoice in what heaven's going to be. And that's a preparation for heaven. There's a sense in which when we gather as the Lord's people on, on, on the Sunday, on the Lord's Day, we are, we are having a foretaste of heaven. When we come to the communion table, we haven't talked about communion. You know, amidst us our beloved stands. The bread and wine are still bread and wine, but Jesus is there. And we're having a foretaste of glory. And Jesus says, you know, you do this until I come. And I often think, you know, when take communion, this may be well, the last one. Either the Lord might have taken me home in death, or he might have just taken me away to be with him. And, and this might be the last time around the Lord's table. And in heaven you don't need bread and wine because Jesus is there himself. One more implication. Yeah? I've oh, got two, yep. Yeah. Yeah, encouraging one another. Encouraging people who are grieving. When you grieve, very often it can be almost a kind of a, a, a little insanity. You just can't get hold of stuff, your emotion. And that's the way it should be, because if, you know, if, if the two become one flesh and the flesh is torn away, it's just, it's just really, really difficult to come alongside and, and to be very gentle and very kind. When Abraham, our little grandson, was born, uh, we went to see them, and I shared a little bit with, with, with Kez, about, about our hope and then we rose to, to leave and Kez began to, to cry Nedry just went and sat next to her and put her arms around her and together they wept it must have been 10 minutes just wept and wailed and cried to God and, and, and that, was, that was a healing thing and we talked about hope but at that point it was look, you know, I, I, I don't know how you feel but, but you know, together let's weep in heaven there's no weeping so don't be afraid to weep. Not all tears are bad in this world. Some are necessary. It's okay to weep because in the place we're going, there's no tears. Okay, any, any questions? That, that, I mean, a million questions we haven't answered today, but are there any questions that are outstanding in your mind about heaven? Yes, at that first and then in front. Back. Two things. 
well, three things. Number one, we can't pull our punches on that. We can't say, well, in the end, everybody will get there because the Bible's abundantly clear. Number two, we don't know who will be in hell. When I was in Chippenham in my first church, there was a strict Baptist pastor who went at the graveside. If he thought the person wasn't a Christian, as they lowered the coffin, he would say, now this person is experiencing the sufferings of hell. Make sure that's not you. Well, I don't think that was a particularly helpful thing to say at that moment in time. But he doesn't know. None of us know. And I'm trying to say, well, you know, there's a broader hope. I'm not saying that. But we don't know who's cried up to God. The, th the thief on the cross cried out the last. So we don't know. So we must never assume. But number three, when we get to heaven, one of the things that happens is that we'll be like, like the Lord. And one of the things that will, will be there is that we will share God's character. And, and this is a hard thing to get our minds around. We will look at the world and we look at creation, we look at heaven through God's eyes of justice. And why, why do people go to hell? Well, because God is holy and just. And, and we won't say that's not fair. The God of all the earth will do what is right. Now, now, he wipes all tears away. I find it difficult at the moment to imagine being in heaven if any of my children or grandchildren are in hell. I find that really difficult. But in heaven, God wipes the tears away. I have no more to say on that. I can't give you a definitive answer. I just know that God will take care of it. And I don't know whether I can say any more than that. There's a question there as well. What do you think will first verse be when you go to heaven? <laughs> okay. I think it'll be, <laughs> I'm glad to be here. Maybe. I don't know. Have you got, what, what will yours be? Speechless. Oh, well, there you go. That's that, that, that. Okay, speechless. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Okay. I think we'll know the past, yeah, I do. Because part of the joy of heaven will be, if we've sinned, to rejoice in our forgiveness. Like, like you know, what, what we said about, about Paul saying to the Thessalonians, you know, you will be my joy. He'll remember that he witnessed to them. I mean, one of the things that we'll share in heaven, one of the things that we don't know now is how the Lord has protected us all through our lives, do we? We don't know what God has done in our lives. In heaven, we'll have a greater knowledge. So we'll say, isn't it amazing? At that moment in time, the Lord delivered me. That, time, that moment in time, the Lord blessed me. That moment in time, God did some amazing thing. And we'll all have stories to tell of amazing grace. And we'll sit around with Abraham and Moses and, and, and people that we've known. We've all got folk that we've known and loved in the past, haven't we? You know, people in our church, people we looked up to, people who led us to the Lord. My old pastor, Les Coley, who died in his 90s, he, he was still preaching at the very end. He was blind, but he was still preaching in the care home. Um, I love him to bits. My, my youth leader, a man called Robin Gibson, who died relatively young. I owe so much to those guys. And I'll thank them in heaven. And, and, and there'll be a kind of sharing of stories. So I think we will know the past. We will know what God has done and how he's led us. Will we be, oh, there's no shame in heaven. I mean, what, when we sin and we remember our failures, we, we are ashamed. But he wipes all away that shame. And so what happens, we see our sin as forgiven. If we remember, when he says God remembers our sin no more, what it means is he doesn't count it against us. He puts it behind his back. He doesn't see our sin. Um, in, in that sense but if we remember the forgiveness it won't be oh I'm so ashamed of myself we'll say how wonderful Jesus was to die for me so I think that's how that will work there was a question here yeah yeah, yeah. the Bible is clear that there's heaven and hell and the way to get to heaven is to trust in Christ yeah and, and uh, Christians well, Christians will be in heaven. If there are people who've, who've, who've rejected Christ, who've never heard the gospel, that's not my call. I have to leave them in God's hands in the end. I can't, I, can't, I can't make a judgment on anyone. What I do know is that heaven isn't just a few little people. It's a number that no one can count. It appears to me, Romans 1, that Paul seems to be saying, um, you know, people know about God. The evidence is in creation. And if they reject it, they reject it. But... And there are degrees of punishment as well as degrees of reward. But when it comes down to that, that's above my pay grade. You know, the, the God of all the earth will do what is right, and I have to leave it in his hands. I don't know in the end, and I can't, I can't prevaricate, thankfully, about people who, who... And so on, I just have to leave that with the Lord. What I have to do is to get on with telling everybody I know about Jesus. That's a great spur. There was a question here? Yeah. Uh -huh. 
be frightening if they were, wouldn't they? Um, I don't think they are. When it talks about that great cloud of witnesses, what he's saying is look at the lives of these people, people in the Old Testament, you know, going back to Abraham and Moses and all these great people of faith. Look at their faith and that will inspire you. So the cloud of witnesses, you know, it seems to me, and I don't know for certain, I wouldn't be dogmatic, it seems to me that, that, that you know, once you're in heaven, that's it. There's no, there's no knowledge of what's going on on earth. But I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I'm not sure that the data in the Bible is enough to tell us that. Well, on earth, um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to shock you. What was the very first command that God gave to Adam and Eve? The very first command that God gave to Adam and Eve was to have sex. So what do Christians believe about sex? Number one, sex is from God. Number two, sex. What is God is for sex. Sex is for marriage. Marriage is for life. So sex is a good thing. The book of Song of Solomon rejoices in, in, in the physical act of sex. And it was necessary because they had to fill the world and populate it. And there was only two of them. And, you know, it's very difficult to populate the whole world with just two of you. So, so in, on earth, there needs to be earthly companionship, and there needs to be marriage, and there needs to be the procreation of children. There's no marriage and there's no procreation of children in, in, in heaven because it's populated with all those who come to know Christ. So, so in that sense, the, the physicality of marriage is not necessary in heaven because it's filled with people. Originally, Adam and Eve had to populate the world. Now we don't. And marriage, of course, as we said earlier, is a symbol or a picture of, of, um, of, of the most wonderful relationship. relationship. And, and people say about, well, you know, <laughs> I remember talking about gender and, and, you know, male and female. Yes, there'll be male and female. And when we say the word sex, that's what we mean, male or female. And we had a really, really godly lady uh, in our first church. And we were talking about heaven. And she was an ex-missionary and very kind of uptight and... And I was saying, you know, there's, there's gender in heaven, you know. And she said, oh, are, you, are you saying that there will be sex in heaven? And all the young people tittered at that. <laughs> and of course, no, there isn't the physical act of sex in heaven. But that's not because it's wrong or it's dirty. C.S. Lewis picks up that and he says, well, you know, that's a great thing in marriage. You celebrate that in marriage. It's not a bad thing. Roman Catholics think it's kind of second right. The Bible says, no, it's good. It's a good gift of God. You enjoy it. And then C.S. Lewis said, well, people say, well, if we're not allowed to do that in heaven, isn't it? It's like, it's like saying to a little boy, you know, here's a bar of chocolate, and he really enjoys the bar of chocolate. And then you say, but now I'm going to take you on a holiday, and we're going to go everywhere you want to go, you know, the most wonderful places, and you have lots of toys and lots of... The, uh, yeah, but you just got to leave the chocolate behind. Well, he's not going to think about the chocolate when he got all that. When we get to heaven, there will be so many joys that we won't grieve over the fact that we're not married anymore. Okay? Any other questions? Will there be animals in heaven? I have no idea. I do not like cats. <laughs> okay? I do not like cats. My wife loves them. I can't see the point of cats. Now, I don't want to upset you. I really don't want to upset you. But, but there are no cats in heaven. There may be dogs. <laughs> but I know there are no cats. Because it says in the book of Revelation, no vile thing will enter into heaven. <laughs> That's how you lose half your congregation. But no, no, there are lots of things I don't know, and there are lots of things we don't know. And I think the, 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 the final point is just that. There are lots of things we, we, we look forward to enjoying, but the clear things, or the, 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 the main things are the plain things, and the plain things are the main things. And it should affect everything that we are and everything we do. I'm going to pray. Father, we do thank you that we have this hope. And the hope is not because we've been good people, or because we've tried hard, or because we go to church, or because we're religious. Our hope is based on Christ, the living hope. We thank you that we are saved because of the mercy of God. We deserve judgment, we've received mercy. We're saved because of the new birth. Not because we have given ourselves new hearts, but you have given us new heart. We're saved because of that, that moment in history when breath came back into the body of Christ, and his eyes twitched and his heart began to beat and he stood up in fullness of life, the conqueror of death. We thank you that he is the first fruits. He's the beginning. He's the start of all that we have to look forward to. So gracious God, help that hope to animate our lives now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen.